Via telephone, we appreciate uh, her patience, uh, by the way. Kelly <laughs> Allen, the Executive Director of the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. Kelly, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Dealing with a little cold, but aren't we all as the weather changes? Yeah, what's with this 30-something degrees in the morning? I'm not looking for that when I get up. <laughs> It's want... rough. I also have a two-year-old, and he's in the Petri dish that is uh, <laughs> child care center. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I never was as sick as I was until we had kids and they went out into the world and brought everything that they touched back with them. So I, oh, yeah. I, I sympathize yeah. with you. <laughs> totally sympathize with you. Uh, Kelly, let's uh, discuss a few things in regards to the uh, – I, I, first and foremost, we talked a little bit about this last week with another guest, uh, Mike Height, who deals with these IDD waivers, uh, Medicaid funding, and the state's funding because uh, I understand that uh, – some of these funds might be reduced, and many of these funds bring additional federal funding. What's your understanding of this, Kelly? That's exactly right. So um, when the state legislature passed their budget last month, they referred to it as a skinny budget. Uh, overall, it's about $700 million less than what we spent on the state budget back in 2019, which was our last pre-pandemic year. Uh, after adjusting for inflation. Uh, and one of the biggest hits to the budget was really through the Medicaid program. Uh, Medicaid, for the reasons you said, is really important to families in West Virginia, to health care providers, and to our broader economy. And because it's a federal state partnership and a matching program, West Virginia pulls down about $3 for every dollar we spend at the state level, we get three federal dollars. Uh, that means it's a critical revenue source for our hospitals and our healthcare system. Uh, but the budget passed last month underfunds Medicaid relative to what the agency said they needed to operate uh, and what the governor proposed by about $150 million. So the IDD waiver program is about $11 million of that, and that's really critically important. But we think it's important to, for folks to understand more broadly, Medicaid was cut by, you know, 15 times that, about $150 million. With a lost federal match, uh, that could cut our Medicaid program next fiscal year by about $600 million, or about 12% of the entire program. Now, uh, Kelly, in regards to the skinny budget, uh, this isn't officially a cut yet, as I understand it. This is the budget to get to the May interims and possible special session where the rest of this will be addressed, Correct. Well, that's what we're hoping. Uh, you know, initially when the budget was passed, that's what we heard from a lot, of, a lot of legislative leaders saying, you know, we'll come back and fix this in May once the question around uh, federal education clawback is addressed, and the governor's now said that's been addressed. Uh, but we've also heard some leaders, I think during interims last week, uh, we've heard President Blair say some things like, does Medicaid, do we need to fully fund Medicaid, or, or is this more of a wait-and-see approach? Um, but I think, you know, we just want to get the message out there that filling that hole entirely, that full $150 million when they come back in the May special session is important. And like you said, we've got the money, right? We've got a projected six to $800 million surplus this year. We can afford to fully fund Medicaid uh, and do even more than that, in fact. Uh, and we need to spend that uh, full amount of money on public services that serve all West Virginians. Why is $150 million the full amount? Is that, is that what brings you the maximum federal dollars back? Well, that was uh, what the governor proposed in his proposed budget, which was based on the agency's request, so what they said they needed to operate at current benefit levels. I see. Uh, and, and um, yeah, to be clear, the budget that was passed was less than uh, Medicaid received in fiscal year 2024. Uh, and in fiscal year 2024, we had an extra Medicaid match from the feds. So for about the last four years, uh, during the, the pandemic era, one way that the federal government reduced constraints on states and got more money to states was by increasing our federal match for Medicaid. So we said uh, normally we pull down about $3 for every dollar we spend. Over that period, we pulled down $4 for every dollar we spent. So one thing that allowed us to do was reduce our state spending on Medicaid as that extra federal Medicaid was, uh, money was coming in. But Legislative leaders, officials within the Medicaid agency always knew that when the, you know, pandemic era programs at the federal level ended, that that Medicaid match was going to go back to normal, uh, and we were going to need that to, you know, bring that additional money back onto the state budget. Uh, and we don't have to talk about it right now, but that's one way we were able to create this flat budget over the last several years, right? We had extra federal money plugging into our education system, into our Medicaid budget and other areas, and, and that's one way we were able to keep the budget flat and one way, way we were able to pass these big tax cuts last year. John, you deal with Medicare. Do you deal with Medicaid as well? 
Um, I deal with a lot of people who are what are called dual eligibles, uh, who mm-hmm. have Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, those are our, our seniors and and or people who have disabilities who are really the neediest of our population. I mean, it's uh, Medicaid is is a huge component of their health care. I mean, it cre- it creates a system where they're able to get health care without having copays and stuff like that. That that people without the extra coverage. Um, without Medicaid yet, so it's. I mean, these these are people who barely have food. These are people who are making, you know, a thousand dollars roughly a month, um, and are trying to trying to live on that. You know, pay rent, pay whatever. But Medicaid is is very important. It's also important to our hospital systems because our hospitals get inundated, and and a lot of people who are in lower economic situations, if they don't have Medicaid or some sort of coverage. They're using emergency rooms as mm-hmm. their health care, and the emergency rooms can't turn them away, and they're not getting paid for it. So without these people being paid for, without some sort of mechanism, especially with the, the $3 for every dollar we spend coming back from the federal government, it's kind of a no-brainer to fully fund what, what Medicaid said they need and what the governor agreed with. Um, just because the federal money coming back and the fact that our hospitals are struggling right now, we've lost, and I can't, what are two, three hospitals in the state in the last five years? And a lot of hospitals' bottom lines are struggling even with all of the COVID money that came in through Medicaid. Those are so many great points. Yeah, I think um, the most recent data I saw was about 80,000 people who are on Medicare also have Medicaid in West Virginia. And, Jonathan, you know this, but I think a lot of folks don't realize that Medicare doesn't cover nursing home care, long-term care. Uh, If folks can't afford that out of pocket, uh, that's generally Medicaid covering that, which is, you know, such a major cost and such an important thing for folks as they age. Um, And that ends up up being a lot of our population because a lot of people – you know, especially people who end up in long-term care situations, even if they have some money, that money does run out. Ooh, and yeah, then it, it switches back. over to where Medicaid is taking care of them. I mean, we've, uh, I mean, it, it, Medicaid is a very, very important part of the safety net of our system. Yeah. And just to um, elaborate on what you said about health care providers relying so much on this, we know that in states that have expanded Medicaid, of which uh, West Virginia is one, we've seen fewer hospital closures. We've seen hospitals have better bottom lines and less uncompensated care. Um, last last week at uh, legislative interims, the, the Secretary of the Department of Human Services, which oversees Medicaid, was asked, you know, if you don't get this funding, what happens? Um, and she said, you know, essentially there are three ways you can cut costs in Medicaid if it's not fully funded. One, you can cut provider reimbursement rates, which we know are, you know, providers already say they're struggling with Medicaid reimbursement rate levels. Two is you cut the population who is eligible. You make fewer people eligible. Or three, you cut optional services. Uh, and when we hear the term optional services, um, there's, there's a menu of things that the feds require that we cover. But optional services are things like uh, long-term care, uh, IDD waiver programs, and other programs for people with disabilities, prescription drugs, physical therapy. These are all things that the feds consider optional services but are really, really particularly important to our population. Uh, and with Medicaid being so flexible, you know, the state of West Virginia has really adopted uh, programs that are important to our people. We were the first state with a substance use waiver, allowing us to pull down those federal dollars to cover substance use treatment. We were one of the first states to expand pregnancy the uh, Medicaid postpartum because we know that year after delivery is so important for moms to, to have health insurance. And uh, obviously things like the dental benefit have been so important. So um, these are really important services to preserve, especially as we get all that federal uh, dollars that helps us pay for the cost of them. Well, and if they, if they cut the reimbursement more for, for doctors, you're going to have more doctors deciding they don't want to take Medicaid which has happened Absolutely. here and has happened in a lot of states where people say, oh, yeah, great, I've got Medicaid, but wait a second, there, there aren't enough providers and there aren't providers with, with openings to see people because, I mean, doctors have, do, a lot of doctors have percentages where they say, heck, I'm going to have this many people who will take, I'll take who are on Medicaid, I'm going to have this many people on Medicare. The private pay, obviously, the regular health insurance, they, they get a bigger reimbursement from that. So mm-hmm. if the Medicaid reimbursement goes down, it's just going to make it more difficult for people to get care. And, I mean, it's, it's just a basic, it's a basic need, obviously. Matt Miller. Absolutely. 
Kelly, you mentioned about about 80,000 West Virginians uh, receiving uh, some assistance through both Medicare and Medicaid. How many in the Mountain State um, receive Medicaid? We are just over about 500,000 uh, in total enrollment. So about half of all kids in West Virginia receive their care uh, through Medicaid, and then uh, a little bit higher of percentage uh, if you count kids with special needs, it's like 60% of kids with special needs uh, than you know, seniors, uh, adults with disabilities, uh, and low-income families. I am stunned by the, a state of almost 1.8 million. You're telling us 500,000 people in West Virginia get Medicaid funding? That's right. Wow. Yeah, I agree. Wow. That's a staggering number when you said that. We are a very economically depressed state. And I mean, sitting here in the eastern panhandle, I, I've, I mean, I go all over the state. I was, I was down in uh, McDowell County, Mercer County a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, sometimes I say, we don't really live in West Virginia. We are, I mean, we're a suburb of D.C. here. We don't notice the economics of the rest of the state as much up here because we don't, we don't have the abject poverty. I mean, we have we have growth. We have we have everything. I mean, we're we're very lucky, and I mean, a lot of our money does go to the other end of the state to help prop up some of our our poorer counties. But uh, five hundred thousand out of one point eight million. I mean, that's it's staggering. That's mm-hmm. the word you stole my. That's the word I was going to. I wasn't. Use. I wasn't thinking you were coming back with that figure, Kelly. I was thinking you're going to say, oh, eighty thousand. <laughs> Well, it's really important to, you know, remember, you know, it's a, it's a lot of, we have a, a older population than most states. We have a population with more folks with disabilities than most states. Um, we cover a lot of kids this way. Uh, but I think, you know, we, we've introduced the economy into the, the conversation. And I think it's really important also to remember what an economic driver Medicaid is for West Virginia. Um, back in 2018, which I think was the last time there was a potential Medicaid shortfall with some budget constraints, uh, the WVU business sorry, Bureau for Business and Economic Research did a study that the hospital association uh, uh, had them do that looked at, you know, the economic impact of cutting Medicaid. Uh, And basically they found, you know, if you cut $100 million from Medicaid at the state level and you lose a resulting federal match, that could cost over 5,000 jobs. So we're talking about one and a half times that, essentially, with this current shortfall. Um, So really thinking about how Medicaid, you know, does, fund physicians at hospitals. Uh, it does pay for physicians and nurses and uh, healthcare workers. And then it drives the broader economy, right? And in rural places where uh, higher percentages of people rely on Medicaid, like the counties that you mentioned, that's in a lot of, that's sustaining healthcare centers uh, and hospitals and the, maybe the, the biggest employer in that district or in that county. Well, if you go to some of these rural health centers, I mean, and I've talked to a lot of people through through our our business i mean sometimes 70 80 percent of people who go to these rural health centers are on medicaid i mean and if you're talking about that if we could lose five thousand health care providers think about how long it takes right now to get in to see a doctor think about how long it takes to get services i needed an ent and i was told hey we've got an appointment in july i mean and it, it unbelievable and then then they but it's but if we lose 5,000 providers, the, the loss of, I mean, the loss of jobs is horrible. But can you imagine the loss of ability to take care of West Virginians? I mean, I'm a proud West Virginian. I love my state. And I, I think that would be catastrophic for us. Absolutely. I mean, we always say, you know, this would essentially undo every economic development or jobs announcement that we've seen in the last five years. Um, it's, it's that big and it's that important. And it's, you know, important on a moral level, on an individual level for the families that rely on these services, but also just, you know, for the state of West Virginia. Our healthcare economy is one of our biggest drivers. So, the, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to ask do those numbers fluctuate much? Uh, are, are there cases where someone gets into a better job situation or even a better health situation that maybe comes off of needing Medicaid, yet others, obviously, maybe due to a, a loss of a job or something, may end up coming on to Medicaid? Yeah, yeah. So, we are basically uh, right now back where we were prior to the pandemic. Uh, we were always in those low 
low 500,000s in the years leading up, like 2018, 2019. Uh, it's about what we averaged. Uh, we went higher during the pandemic, obviously the recession that was related to it and job loss and health issues. Uh, but now we're basically back down to where we were. Uh, it fluctuates by you know, 10,000 or so, uh, but but it is, while the number stays relatively steady, it is, you know, different people coming on and going off. Uh, and, and another thing I think to remember is that a lot of um, jobs in West Virginia are seasonal, a tourism industry, service industry, things like that, um, can be low paying where people still qualify for Medicaid, or they can be seasonal when people work for a few months and they don't qualify and then they go back on when they're laid off. Uh, so some of it really is about like our, our job mix and our economic development mix. Do you know where we rank? I mean, I, I'm just thinking, I mean, it's not even one out of four West Virginians are on Medicaid. Do you know mm -hmm. where we rank as far as percentage of population being covered by Medicaid? Mm, I don't know off the top of my head. I stumped I mean, the band. The, the top, the top quintile for sure. Well, Kelly, then, if, and if I missed this earlier, sorry, but uh, what percentage of that 500,000 are actually working poor? Well, I know that um, – oh, my mind just went totally blank. I don't know that I have that data point right in front of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, because, you know, the the image that's painted of the person receiving the government check is somebody who's not working. Mm. But I do know well, – I think, you know, a, um, a my, big section of these are kids, seniors, folks with disabilities – there are a heck of a lot of working poor on Medicaid. I mean, I know there are there are companies that when all the new rules came out, they cut everybody's hours so they wouldn't have to provide them health insurance. Um, so a lot of them are, I mean, a lot of them are getting Medicaid. I mean, with the way wages have risen in the past few years, uh, probably less of them are getting Medicaid. And I know we did have the huge amount of people on Medicaid for a while during COVID. And during mm -hmm. COVID, there was no recertification. So people who lost their job for three months, went on Medicaid, ended up staying on it for a year or two, three, mm -hmm. and are now, now with the recertifications. Yeah, th those people are coming off, and it's only the people who, who need Medicaid who are actually on it now. But, wow, I just keep going back to that 500,000 number and <laughs> Rob's face when you said it. I mean, I was just. <laughs> hey, uh, just to wrap this up, Kelly, so between now and May, what are you hearing in regards to what the intent of the legislature ultimately will be regarding this funding? Well, I've heard, I mean, a lot of uncertainty. I think there's a, a, a real acknowledgement that if we didn't fully fund Medicaid, we'd be leaving that federal those federal dollars on the table and really – uh, putting our healthcare providers and families who rely on Medicaid at risk. Um, but, you know, we're just going to have to see what happens. I think it's really important for folks to, to contact their lawmakers uh, and to make sure they understand the economic and individual impacts of, of funding Medicaid for, for families and healthcare providers who rely on them. Kelly Allen, thank you so much. We appreciate and uh, your, your participation today and your patience at the beginning. Uh, tell Seth to uh, feel better. Will do. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Seth DeStefano was initially going to do that interview. Then he uh, became ill at the thought of talking with me. So Kelly Allen <laughs> jumped in, and we appreciate her being able to tolerate me. I get that feeling in the morning when I'm heading here. <laughs> That's why you're always last. <laughs> <laughs> That's why last man is. <laughs>